satisfy yourself. Sharon? Yeah. Before you start, could you explain the difference between psychoactive, psychotropic, and psychedelic? Because I don't understand what they mean. Yeah, if I can. Uh, a psychoactive means exactly what it implies, that you can detect this compound as a higher cortical experience. That's all. I mean, to my mind, a higher cortical experience is a shift of mood, uh, depression, elation, uh, uh, acute hearing, sensitivity to noises. All of these things could be classed as psychoactive uh, reactions to a compound. Psychotropic is a word that I've never been very fond of, and it sort of came in late. Uh, uh, psychedelic, which is a fairly maligned word, but was coined by the psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond, uh, means simply mind manifesting. And I like that because it's phenomenologically neutral. Now, some people have tried to push the word entheogen for these things meaning literally God-inducing. But to my mind, this carries a huge amount of ideological freight that we may not or wish to buy into. I mean, maybe it's God-inducing, maybe it isn't. But uh, uh, psychedelic, meaning mind-manifesting, is pretty good. And then if all of these make you uncomfortable, you can just fall back on a completely phenomenological description and call them consciousness expanding drugs but there are drugs that I would not I for instance I don't consider well I certainly don't consider alcohol a psychedelic but clearly a psychoactive uh, what about MDMA or marijuana? well uh, marijuana is one of these things that's so widely variant both in how people react to it and how strong it can be. I would call MDMA a psychoactive drug, not a psychedelic drug. And then I use the word hallucinogen a lot. And a lot of people don't like that, even people in the field, and say, well, hallucinogen seems to imply that it's an illusion. But not in my mind, I don't hear that. I'm fascinated by hallucinations. I mean, to me, that is the sine qua non that you're getting somewhere. I guess because it's just my philosophical biases. But, when, but a hallucination, it's such an extraordinary concept, isn't it? To see something which isn't there. And I don't mean to misread a surface so that you think it sticks into the room which in fact sticks out of the room or something. I mean seeing something that is not there. And then that divides into two classes, seeing an ordinary object which is not there. And I think this is what most people think a hallucination is. Here is a bicycle. Is it real or not? The drug-crazed victim cannot tell. <laughs> but most hallucinations are of things which can only be hallucinations because they, that's what they are, you know. And so they have this aura of the unexpected and the other and, uh, and the intrusive alienness. Uh, people have claimed to me that they have seen objects which are not there, which are completely ordinary. That is more typical of accounts of detura users, people who take uh, high molecular weight tropanes such as occur in Jimson weed and those kind of things. But my brief experimentation with that is it is a, what I call a, a, a deliriant rather than a psychoactive. I mean, when you take Detura, you are so messed up that you can't, you literally lose all discrimination. Belladonna. Yeah, Belladonna. You can't tell exactly where you are. You can't tell thinking about being somewhere from being there. Well, this you're in no shape to undertake a spiritual quest if you're that discombobulated. So uh, 
what I like are the things which do not destroy what I call core functions. In other words, there is still an evidence-gathering, observing mind left intact, and the um, disruption of perceptual input, if you want to put it that way, is pretty much confined to the visual cortex and then to the to the uh, metaphor forming capacity that is relating to the visual cortex. But I don't like things which confuse you, which impair judgment. Uh, what about sativa divinorum? Salvia divinorum. Well, that's a kind of a, that's an obscure one about which not much is known although in the past year they've learned the absolute chemical characterization of the psychoactive compound, which is called salvorine alpha. Um, more work has to be done. Anthropologists who have taken it with Indians uh, in Oaxaca describe a very intense experience. When we grew it in Hawaii and took it exactly the way these people said to do it. It was an experience, but it was not clear whether it was psychedelic or merely so f physiologically active in such a complex way that you couldn't tell exactly what was going on. The impression, which was not mine, but uh, uh, cats and a beloved dean, uh, they both experienced... Uh, flow. They describe the experiences as though you were lying in a dirty ditch <laughs> with this cold fluid flowing from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and where this kind of cold, clammy fluid encountered energy obstructions in your body, it would wash them away. But it was a kind of vertigo with nausea, with I mean, it was a complex uh, experience, but it was not largely mental. Mm -hmm. It was more a revisioning of the body image. And, you know, this is another one of these things where no research uh, has been done. It isn't illegal, uh, Salvia Divinorum, but you're not going to do your career any good to get tangled up with this. So consequently, it's pretty much left alone. Salvorine alpha is extremely unstable and breaks down within 12 hours. So that indicates it's probably a polyhydric alcohol or an isoquinone or something like that. It's not an indole. Yeah. I'm just curious, um, and Watson talks about entheans versus hallucinogens, and uh, he's really against the word hallucinogen. Yeah, he's the one who proposed entheogen. Entheogen, right. And so, because he, his theory was, I guess, that he thought that a hallucination was something that wasn't there completely. And he thought that the experience on the soma or the mushroom was something that you actually are experiencing. So it's not a hallucination, it's real. Yeah, that was what he said. Um, but if you actually look at the etymology of the word hallucination, what it's come to mean in English is a delusion, a delusion. But what it really means in the original uh, language is to wander in the mind. That's the meaning of hallucination, to wander in the mind. Well, that's a pretty good operational description of what's happening. And then when you add in the visual component, uh, uh, I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine how someone could undervalue hallucinations if they had had them. Yeah, it sounds like he was reacting to, to the 60s hoopla a lot, the, the, uh, the hoopla over LSD and the, the misreading of what these experiences really were, too. Well, these guys were very uh, frustrated with seeing this thing turned into a social hysteria. And Wasson, you know, at times expressed great unhappiness with Tim Leary's approach and hated going to Mexico and seeing these mushroom villages invaded by graffiti-covered vans of filthy freaks from Southern California who were disrupting the local ecology. And uh, 
it was a kind of proprietary approach, you know, this thing belongs to anthropologists, to specialists. Uh, Watson was very reticent to, to assess his own work. Some of you may have seen Bob Forte's interview with him in the, that psychedelic issue of revision where Forte asks him, how do you assess the historical impact of your work? And he said, you know, I, I'll leave that to others to decide. He didn't want to deal with the question of the potential impact on his own society. He really looked at it as this exotic, foreign kind of thing. These guys were cautious, this first generation. Hoffman, Wasson, Schultes. These, are, these guys are not stoners by any means. I mean, their approach is cautious and the psychedelic experiences can be counted on the fingers of one hand in a lifetime. So I'm not sure they ever realized the size of the tiger whose tail they had seized. 